Welcome to Classic Burners. Today is going to be a real fun and special episode because we got this two-way thing that's happening here. We got the West Coast writers. They're also the best writers that can rap. It goes both ways, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we're we're going to get right into the graffiti side of things. And by doing that, uh, we're going to go into each of y'all's independent area. And why don't we start off with Stro? Talk about your area and your origins. Okay, the area I'm out of is known as uh, <clears throat> Crenshaw District, Lemur Park. I grew up on the street uh, on 10th Avenue in Vernon. The, um, the gang around there is the Rolling 40 Crips. That's the area I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first love was graffiti, and then came uh, MCing. Afterwards, you know, I was um, a part of a crew called MBT. Back in the days, I started writing in 87. Nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. And we all, I met them when I went to Audubon, a school, a junior high school called Audubon in 87. Uh, moms tried to deter me from going to Audubon and send me to a school called Oval Wright, where I met a lot of um, Slauson cats, like uh, Cesar, Gaze, Kaser. Aller. Well, Kaser and Paris and them had just left when I got there. They kind of like a couple of grades above me. But at, in 87, I met uh, my homeboy uh, Snooze. Snooze One, um, AKA he later was writing Teach from MBT, but that's the one who first um, got me into to writing, you know, um, in music class. He, he showed me um, a Posca marker. That was the first marker I ever had, Uni Posca, until I found out they wasn't permanent. You know what I'm saying? All right, cool. And then, uh, so that's how you found out about writing. How did you uh, first start? Um, as a toy. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My first, the first name I started writing was 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 Curse, C E R S E, and then I started writing Spec. I, you know, as as we all ran through a lot of names and stuff. But yeah, eighty seven was when I first. Um, told myself like I'm gonna do this you know what I'm saying straight writing graffiti started as a bus mobber and then grew in to peace and a little bit later I started paying more attention to Slauson and the Slauson wall um you know it was a lot of pieces going up over there around this time okay cool now Rocco we're gonna switch over to you all right let's talk about the area you came up in and your origins um I grew up in mid-city LA um Early on, it was like Crenshaw and Washington. And then from the time I was 12 on, it was Pico and Fairfax. Um, I went to uh, John Burroughs Junior High School. And while I was at John Burroughs, um, I met like my man Sev, um, Cesar from WCA. He was boo boo fresh at the time. What uh, year is this? This would have been. 85, I think, something like that. Okay. I think something like that. Um, Ralph M. from Funk Dubious and K-Day, he was DJ DJ Crush. So that him and Cesar had a rap group called Crush and Boo Boo Fresh. <laughs> like, that was wow. that era. Wow. Um, who else was around? Uh, DJ Rob One, rest in peace, he was around. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, that's when I started. Just started hanging around with cats and... Um, like 86, somewhere like maybe around 86, I think, um, this crew, C2D, Create to Devastate, started. And uh, I just, that's the crew I was. I pretty much started running with from Jump. That was um, Tez. Was, uh, C2D, like, I think Tez might have been from R2K at the time, um, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, yeah, him and this dude named Dre's, who used to roll with a bunch of uh, K2S guys and whatnot, Um Drace? Drace, D-R-A-Z-E. Okay. Um, but that was like at John Burroughs. Um, from there, I ended up through Rob One being real cool with them. Like Skate used to come up to the, to, to John Burroughs and like pass his markers through the fence, you know, um, graphics, you know, eddings or whatever, like pass his markers through the fence, pilots, or we, he'd, you know, bring Marsh Ink and, you know, we'd be making our own our own joints out of like shoe, uh, shoe polish bottles, just mm -hmm. flooding them and, you know, um, Flowmaster and Marsh, mostly Marsh at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing like early, early splits on on um, 
when Mean Streaks came out doing early splits, like even like before we learned how to like open them all the way up and whatever, we would just like flood them with like designs and like just get swirled like marbles in them and, mm-hmm. and all kind of things. But I ended up going from there after after John Burroughs, um, where I met a bunch of people. I ended up going to Fairfax High School for a minute, and that, you know that was like a totally different situation. There was a lot of a lot of people that were a lot of writers that were there. Um, I got asked politely to leave Fairfax at some point. <laughs> yeah, asked politely to leave. They said I wasn't welcome there for a little while, so I got I ended up going to uni, and at uni I was at school with Mech. Um, Dello, rest in peace, Mr. Monk, rest in peace. Sir was there. Um, was Pony Boy from WCA, Pony 94. Uh, it was a lot of cats there. And then the NSA crew, shout out to the NSA crew, a bunch of the NSA guys are going up there because it was in the hot, far on the west side. But yeah, I was, I was Doom, around a lot. Doom was there, right? I believe, I'm not, I think so. I think Doom might have been there. Yeah. Um, but it was dope. It was, you know, and I was, you know, it was a, it was kind of a weird era. Like it was an era, the, the, the scene I was around, there was a lot of like hardcore gangs. There was trendy gangs. They were like, it was just a different, it was mm. a different time. So you had, you had cats gang banging in like creepers and turtlenecks and, you know, banging right next to cats in khaki suits and whatever else, you know, like it was all happening at the same time. So that's when like you had those gangs like the, uh, um, Poser, Scandal, Sex Jerks. Yeah. Like the, they were like those KOD, gangs that we were talking about. KODs, yep, exactly. Right. Okay. And even later on they had like Gumbies, like, yeah. you know, different things. But then also at the, around that same time you had, you know, like, I guess it would be called Stoner. I mean, you had, like, SR, like, Sacred Reich. You had, like, different things that were happening at the, at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was maybe less political. It was a lot more colorful. You know, the gang, it felt a lot more like, like, uh, almost like some warriors type <laughs> shit. You know, like, different, you know, but a lot of time, it was, yeah. like, before a lot of the politics came in, and it was just, you know, it was a different time. But that's just the era I grew up in. Get Up Stickers is the ultimate bombing sticker. Made from military grade materials, these stickers are super easy to peel and were made for putting on tanks. So you know they're gonna last. So click on the link below to submit your designs. You don't want to sleep on this. Cool. Yeah. How important were hand styles to you guys? Graffiti hand styles? Graffiti hand styles. Uh, super important. Super important. Especially because out of LA you had such strong like gang styles like the calligraphy stuff was so clean and so perfect like it was like so you wanted to have that same perfection but then you look at you know what's going on like writer styles and you're like okay you got to apply that same sense of aesthetic to it like Mm -hmm. that same like balance and clarity you wanted that same feeling even though it it wasn't looking the same but yeah I mean you know there was LA has a definitely has its own history even going back to like you know Chas Bjorquez and like different people like that that were able to like really bring some build some of these bridges so yeah yeah, it's always been super important to me okay and then um the the next chapter in your adventure um i think what was it 87 88 there started being a writer's bench up on lemur in lemur park (laughs) it first started at this spot called uh, um the 40 stop which was uh it was kind of down the street from audubon and we will do early morning bus mobbing Driver size, destinations, rooftop, everything that had to do with bus mobbing. And we would meet right there. And it was this one old lady that had a house, that apartment right there. And fools would just tag all on her doors, man. I, I feel sorry for her because she, she had no get back as far as stopping us. But um, yeah, the 40 stop. And then that spot started, started getting burnt because the, with the 40, we also had Walkman spots and clothes spots that the 40 took us right to, which is South Bay. You know, fools had had tapes, tape spots where we go rack tapes and Walkmans and Stussy was out, guests and all that stuff, you know. So rather than going to school, we just hop right on the bus after the mob and then congregating is done and just go straight to South Bay one shot. But once the 40 stop, bus stop started getting hot, then we moved it down to Lamert Park. You know, and which the 40, and now we had action at the 40, the bus, the 210 bus, the 105 bus, all from Lemur Park right there. And then um, that's where a lot of newer, younger MBT cats started getting put on, you know, and we, then they tried to start like a little gang called Lemur Park Mile, who was jumping fools on that. And 
at Lamert, I can remember one incident where we was making so much noise that like for Lamert Park, it was like a cultural me cultural uh, cultural mecca of of Los Angeles. So you had a lot of uh, Muslims and 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 Moors and stuff around there. So one day we got into it with the Muslims. Man, they came and shot the park up. You know what I'm saying? We was making so much. We didn't respect nothing, man. We just you know nothing but trouble is all we was doing. You know. So at Lamert Park. We started making so much noise where the, the Fodies would start coming up there and start like, who are y'all? And start trying to recruit cats and stuff like that, it's, especially when we started that that little quote unquote gang for like two seconds called the Murt Park Mob. That's when other gangs, we started getting on the radar of other gangs around the area. So um, yeah, the Murt Park man is where we used to, we used to raise hell right so there. Who were some of the key crews and individual writers at that Writer's Bench. At that Writer's Bench, you had uh, User, Punish, Rear, NTS, Flex was up there, Fabe, um, Carson, NTS. It was an MTS, MBT type of thing. You know, Mo was around, K-Dubs was, was around. Then um, Search floated through there a few times. You know, um, Homeboy Japper, Zev, uh, Rear. Dev. Yeah, Rear, NTS. Webster. Web, yep, Bell, um, Resism, like, man, it was Resent, Tense, uh, Shank. It was a lot of, lot of cats would come from the east side all the way to come up to Lamert. You know what I'm saying? From the Compton area and stuff. Say. Mm -hmm. Cats from the harbor too, right? Mm-hmm, mm hmm And then when my own boy Wrist, he moved to the valley. He was a valley, uh, stayed in the valley, and then he, he, MBT kind of spread to the valley a little bit. Yeah. Simple and Say. Yeah, all them guys. All right. Well, that um, what happened with uh, there was a trouble gang after that or something. Yeah, after that it it well actually MBT went up under uh, one gang known known as the the Hoovers, which was enemies of the area that I grew up in. So when they went under that gang and started Five One Trouble, that's when I, I parted ways because I mean I have the area I have to live in is is. A neighborhood gang, which is uh, enemies with with the Hoovers. Okay. So you know, I bid them farewell, mm -hmm. and then I stayed on, you know, my stuff. Which is, uh, you know, graffiti from MBT. You had a handful of people that was really about the the, the culture, like style wise. My homeboy Rain One, rest in peace. He he got put on forties a little bit later, but he he got um killed up at Hollywood High School by um, some M MWAs and stuff. And, but Rain was, was really about the hand styles, really had characters and, you know, was really about it. All right. Um, and then um, we'll go back to Raka. So now what, what happens after that point, after your high school days, you get a little bit older now, fresh kind of, you know, getting a little, expanding a little more. What were some of the, I think at that time, what Melrose started jumping Melrose off, the hip hop started, shops jumping. started yeah. popping up and stuff. Tell, tell us about your experience in those days. Yeah, uh, Melrose started jumping for sure. I mean, Melrose was all you know, like for CBS and for some of the people I was rolling with. Melrose was always popping, and it's down the street. Like at the time, it seemed pretty far, but nowadays it's just down the street from um, Sunset and Fairfax, which was KSN Yard at the mm -hmm. time, like behind the Arco. Um, so we would be up in that area anyway. But um, after high school, Melrose really started kind of taken off um so you know a lot of people i would see the writers the writers bench i'd be at was on was at carl's jr it was mm -hmm. on olympic and fairfax back in the day so a lot of those people i knew there were starting to hang out on melrose also and um hex opened uh the hip-hop shop it was the, the, just one sh one store at that time mm -hmm. and we heard about it you know writers so you hear like oh hex opened up a store so we go to check out the store, and I just started hanging out there all the time. I lived on I lived on Fairfax and Pico, so to me it was just a, two, a quick two seventeen, and I was I was right there all the time. So I'll be up there every day, and um, yeah, ended up ended up starting to work up there. And, Can you describe that this legendary store? Because I don't think in any of the um, podcasts so far we've talked about that. So because yeah. it, it was popping, and so I'd love for people to just get a feeling of how live it was and like the, oh, what was, was going great. on in there. It was great. It was almost like. It was almost like a uh, almost like a day club, you know, like a like a social club. So, um, you know, um, when it was first started, it was kind of a small spot. Eventually, it expanded into two stores, like two store, um, two rooms, two rooms. Yeah, 
But at the time, it was just one smaller room. It was just, you know, set up so it was tight in there. But there was linoleum on the floor. Like, there was there was space to move. There, You know, eventually there was, like, it turned into, like, a hip-hop club. Like, pretty much every day it would be packed. People from all over the world would come in and see, you know, you had, you know, writers from all over. I remember meeting um, Jason Cantu, Lumit, like, all kind of different people from Germany or from wherever were coming in there. <coughs> So it was live though, man. Um, there was, you know, um, you were there, so you already know. Um, I was working there. Zulu Gremlin was working there. Um, I see Markski. I think Markski was working there at the. T- yeah, he was. Markski was definitely working there. He was just always be painting, but he was working there. Um, Pin One would be spinning. Pin One from um, AM Seven. Uh, Rob One. Sometimes. Rob One would be up yeah. there all the time. Of course, Hex and Omega. Um, but it was dope, man. It was it was really dope. Uh, I remember even when they expanded from one store to the other store and they needed to lay cement, Kid Frost came up there and taught us, you know, he took off his rings, sent me to the, mm-hmm. threw me the keys to his LeBaron. I went to, to back in the days, there was the um, the Sears and the Builders uh, Builders Emporium and all that mm-hmm. right there um, by by Mid-City, by the, um, the bowling alley across mm-hmm. the street from the bowling alley and from World on Wheels. So I went up there and bought like all the stuff to mix cement and he taught me how to mix cement and we laid the floor to help lay the floor down and everything. So... But yeah, no, it was it was live, man. The, um, they would have open turn, t- you know, open turntables, open mics. The floor was open um, across the street. It was in the all pieced lot. up and tagged up in there too. Like it, everything it was, was fresh, bombed up. Fresh even style. even outside on the side wall, because you know they had the alley yeah. side that was bombed. Um, right across the street, there was a short wall right next to the printing place, and then in that lot there was another wall. Then the alleys all the way up there. There was a lot of CBS stuff in those alleys, but but right around the hip-hop shop, a lot of it was just people that were... Hex was that, invited to Hex through. got those walls across that had, like, the nice productions. He did some legendary exactly. productions. Exactly. Absolutely. There. For sure. So there was a lot of dope stuff there, man, but it was always, you know, who, people... I remember being... And then the old old uh, pyro wall right there, too, just right next... Next couple door. Of shops down yeah, next door. For sure. Excellent. They had burners on that wall. Definitely. There. Definitely. And it was always live, and it was right, right across the street. What was it on Ogden, I think? So it was, like, if you look walked out the shop and looked to the right, you're looking at, like, the, the entrance to Fairfax High School. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then that helped build up. Like, Beat Nonstop came. A lot of other stores came because we brought so much hip-hop culture and flavor to that area. Um, that a lot of these other shops popped up and it kind of became one of these things. Trying to copy the format. You know, you know what it is. (laughs) Trying to plug in. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, it was dope, man. It was always dope. I met a lot of good people there. That's actually where Ev and I first started working together. Uh, We met before that at Mm -hmm. um, at Motor Yard, actually, but we first started, we we first met each other as as MCs at the hip-hop shop. Do you remember too that the dudes from Power One Hundred Six got wind of it and came down? What, what, what was the dude's name? That was the um, Eric Kuvici, maybe. Eric Kuvici, yeah, yeah. Wasn't yeah. he like the main dude? Yeah, and then he's he tried one of to. Me. From there, he 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 saw the energy of the hip hop coming back, and he kind of started promoting it like on Power One Hundred Six. And kind of that does sound they familiar. They changed the format. Yeah, like, yeah. They started doing hip hop. Where hip hop lives, where hip hop lives, and yeah, all that stuff, and they started selling shell toes the way the shop did. Right, you know, remember that? Yeah, for, they got I, Adidas to remake the shell toes. I remember like going with with Zulu Gremlin. Like we would go to like South Central. We go to like out in, in, in near his area, which was like Pico Rivera, like all all over the place, like outside of the Hollywood area. Mm-hmm. But uh, and we and then we go to like old shoe stores, and they'd be like whatever you want, it's in the back. Like, you know, we go in there and there'd be shells and suede, Adidas, Pumas, whatever you wanted. Just, they would just have them thrown. Like, they yeah. didn't even care anymore because they weren't they really were popping at that. So, yeah. yeah. So they, we'd fill up Zulu, had a Taurus. We'd fill up his Taurus and run him back to the hip hop shop and mm-hmm. Hex would put him up for, you know. Yeah. Um, OG Chino um, from uh, from Escala, you know, uh, now shout out to my man OG Chino. That's my twin. We got the same birthday, but um, he used to have a booth in the hip hop shop. So mm-hmm. he had like a little, you know, because he had like one of the original hip hop like record stores mm-hmm. in the area. I think it was yeah. off Slauson, if I'm not mistaken. But so he ended up putting like yeah. a, a booth inside the hip hop shop records. with records and stuff in the back. Yeah. So it was live, man. It was, it was like a, I met a lot of good people and I don't think there, there definitely wouldn't have been a dilated peoples if it wasn't for, for the hip hop shop. Cause that's also, where I met the beat junkies and a lot of other people through that. During that time too, Hex was like, learning and growing and spiritually and stuff. And he, he did a lot of good, like and trying to influence the kids in a positive direction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. I, you could tell that he really, he had gone through things and he wanted to make sure that the, whatever he was putting out represented his growth and his change, yeah, you know, yeah. and some people, you know, didn't like it. Yeah. Some people, you know, didn't take to it well, but you know, Hex was about what he was about. Like he mm-hmm. definitely felt that and he didn't want to, 
put out one message and live a different way. He's yeah, like, yeah. I'm going to, you know, so yeah, yeah. I have a lot of respect. And, and you know, to be honest, I'll keep it real. Like, one of the reasons I could rap the way I rap is because Hex used to put me through my paces. Like, he would mm-hmm. have, you know, the turntable set up. Where he, I remember later on, there was like a big chain link fence mm, yeah. around the turntables. And he'd be like, no, kick it again, bro. Kick it again. And I, he'd be like, no, more, more, more. And he would like, we really be... And he was, Hex was nice. Like, he was like, yo, he used to go battle cast with Ice T and like Frost and he like all these people. He was a battle style rapper. He was a battle style rapper. And he even had like some dance hall styles and all kind mm-hmm. of things. I was like, yo, Hex is nice with it. But mm-hmm. no, Hex used to really push me to like, and that's why even to this day, like I tell him, I'm like every every chance I get, like, yo, I learned a lot from you, bro. Like mm-hmm. learned a lot. I'll never forget it. Like, you know, you know, I think it's important to give to give props to the people that, that you know, help push you forward. So, yeah. I agree. All right, Stro. So talk talk to us about now how you went from that area, got away from the negative stuff, and started getting into the masterpieces. Well, um, like after uh, after I got I got kicked out of Audubon, and then I went to a school called Horseman, uh, where I continued with the bus mobbing. But when I got to John Burroughs, I did my ninth grade term term. I did my. <laughs> that's not yet. <laughs> but I, I did my my whole ninth grade at John Burroughs, where I got exposed to a lot of stuff. You know, I started seeing um, Mir Hex. You know, what I'm saying you, um, just a lot of different pieces as I went more West Side with it. You know what I'm saying? Because. Our side, we didn't really have a lot of that stuff. You know, we had a, uh, the machine was at work very strong in our area. And then when I say the machine, it's like you have a spot reserved for you in a gang before you even leave the porch, some people. You understand? So that was setting in and Foos was, was dying and stuff like that. So when I got to John Burroughs, which is a more culturally diverse school, I got exposed to, uh, more of the art side of it and started being able to um, tell different styles like throw ups, wild styles and, you know, stuff like that. Who were some of the more proficient graph artists in that South Central area during those times? Like CCA and MCAT? CMA, CMA. CCA, um, Create, Mark 7, Castro, um, Alski, Paris, um, Kaser, um, the, the Slauson clan cast had a lot of um, strong. How about Rish? Rish, Rish, yep. I want to say also rest in peace to Lur One from CCA. Rest in peace, Lur. Fresh dude right there. Yeah, definitely. You know, but um, at Lamert, we had a spot called I Fresh where I would pass by it a lot and see a canvas up in there with graffiti in there, and that kind of also planted seed as well. And, you know, the Crenshaw Wall as well when they did that um, Ice-T tribute over there. And uh, I've seen a lot of styles go up over there, you know, so, yeah. Fresh. All right, Raka, um, let's, now the hip-hop shop eventually closes. Yeah. Hex um, goes on in another direction. Um, and you continue on in rap. Let's take it from after the hip hop shop, how you started building up um, your music career. Yeah, well, at the hip hop shop, like I said, um, even though I met a lot of people, like that's when I was really starting to take music seriously. Um, I started to get a feel for it. And then Evidence, who was uh, at the time, he was writing Vane, AWR. So um, I already knew, <coughs> I already knew uh, Eclipse and some of the AWR dudes. I knew. Um, Two tone was two around. tone, yeah. I Self, was I was around. real cool with Self, Self was you know, Fremont. So and so we had a lot of friends in common. And Ev just invited me one day. He's like, "Yo, my next door neighbor is um is QD three is Quincy Jones' son, and he's producing a, a a track for me. He's producing a track for me, and um it's gonna be a posse cut. You, know, I want you to come in and and do a verse on this posse cut." And I'm like, "All right, like I had never done anything like that before. Like uh, you want to record me, Quincy Jones? I'm cool. I'm with it." I don't know what happened. Some kind of way when it all came down to it, he and I were the only two people that showed up, ended, showed up for the session or something like that. So we just ended up doing a song. and It came that, off? Yeah, it worked out. That turned out to be the base of what Dilated Peoples was. Like mm. we, we decided to do another song and then another song. And then and dude was feeling you guys, huh? Yeah, so we ended up working on a bunch of stuff and that became Dilated Peoples. But that was that was kind of how it, um, how it really came together. But 
there was a lot of good stuff that was happening at the hip hop shop as far as people coming in there. Rom, there were rap. We were doing rap battles. You know, we were doing stuff like battles there or across the street at Fairfax and things like that. So, was Dilator already around at that point, or was that? No, nah, it wasn't. And it wasn't. Even, Originally, our first no, no, no. We we weren't dilated yet. Um, dilated came a little bit later. Right? A little bit later, yeah. Late, once the hip hop shop, 90s, yeah, right? we just met there and we ended yeah. up working. But by the time by the time we ended up doing like taking it seriously, it, you know, a couple of years had passed already from from the hip hop shop era. Okay, so now let's go a little bit forward. A lot of cool things came together, in in particular, also that involved dilated, and then at the time. Ultra, my bro, and myself were doing the SP Magazine. Yeah. Omar. And SP Magazine was um, a concept, and it's right here. As a matter of fact, these two issues, these two issues of SP uh, right. have the dilated peoples. This was an early issue. And so this is exactly when, I think you guys came out with your first release, right? Probably so. Yeah, I think so. That was around the, that was super early. That was super early. Super early. Yeah. And uh, what was... Uh, what was what was the song that was the hit then when you first came out? It might have been Third Degree or Work the Angles Time. Work the Angles. Work the Angles work, Time. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. It was yeah, work, work the, the angles. angles, yeah. All right. And then um, at that time, so the concept was we, we wanted, he, my bro had a printing business going and he had a, a connection to just get, get uh, be able to get printing like for rock, dirt cheap. Yeah. So his idea was why don't we, you know, it's an opportunity for us to do something that can kind of uh, push hip hop, but because the magazines at the time were owned by the industry, right, 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 like the source and rap pages, really because of money. You know what I mean? They were limited that they had to get ads and all right. that. They were kind of you know, the record labels ran them, like right. basically put who they wanted, and it was not. It was a lot of groups that really they weren't the skillful rap type of groups, a lot of them, yeah. or they just, they were getting front pages and covers and stuff that I don't think they deserved them the same way. Like dudes that were really in the street honing in their skills. Like we felt like underground rappers needed to get exposure, like album covers, get respect. Absolutely. In magazines. We also felt that graffiti, we wanted a well-rounded, like the, that's why the classic burners article was in here. And that's what this podcast is based off. Right where I was documenting recording history from areas and writers that was going to be lost because we saw that eventually corporate corporate America was going to take it over and right. a lot of that was going to get lost. So we wanted to get that down. We also felt that b-boyism at the time had an underground, uh, um, it had a strong um, movement still, but it wasn't getting any exposure like in the media, in at that time, there wasn't YouTube. There wasn't none of that. Right. And so we wanted to give them their due respect and do stories and cover them and showcase B-boys that were still doing it. The LA Breakers were still going with new generations. Yeah. Um, you know, Rocksteady Crew did a West Coast division. Yeah, they I was still, part of that. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were starting organiz like big events, like the B-boy summits and right. these sorts of things. So we wanted to support that, and we did. And then also with the uh, DJing, we'd get like the invisible scratch pickles and right. feature groups that were all turntablists. Yeah. You know, and also um, beatboxing and things like that. We'd even throw stuff like that in there. Yeah, you know for I mean? sure. And so it worked out real good until, and then so part of that was the Night Hip Hop Stole Christmas mm -hmm. shows, which we started doing as an annual event. Right. Um, and those started growing. They became a success really on a street level, like, so the magazines we'd give out and promote them at record shops, whatever, just like give them out, pass them to kids at shows. And then we would advertise those shows and man, and some of them concerts would draw like just all the, the kids, like the hip hop kids from the city from all over. Right, yeah, absolutely. And they were really um, amazing shows, bro. And we'd incorporate graffiti competitions in there, b-boying. And I think you guys headlined a couple of the shows, right? Or I think performed one, at them? Yeah, yeah, I think one, one, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then you guys were also on the covers. Yeah, that was big. The, being on the cover, I mean, it, it, nowadays... The second cover. This is with when... I think Coffee out. did that one. Coffee did this. Yeah, this yeah. is like, a, man, this is an awesome work of art. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays, you know, you could, you could, you know, pull up a million magazines on your phone or whatever the case was. And as you were saying, back in those days, if you weren't part of the, like, a big part of the corporate machine, then it was hard to, like, really get out there unless you had, like, some some ingenuity and some resources to mm -hmm. make it happen. So 
to be on the cover of, of, of a magazine that had the base of something like SP, which was, it was really big for us. Like these things were happening at the time that we were moving forward. And, you know, as you take steps, sometimes you don't know where the ground is going to be under you. So to be on the cover of these things, they put, it put us in a light that we wanted to be seen in. Mm -hmm. And it showed the rest of the industry, like, oh, these, you know, these cats right here, they're a force just to be seen like that. Mm -hmm. And not even just to be on the cover, like even just to be, featured and covered and to be a part of these events. And what you were saying. It was not really word, important, but yeah. to actually be on the cover, that put us in the in the mind, that put us in the the in the view of other people. They're looking at it like, okay, they're cover worthy. You know, like, and it, it, it definitely did a lot for us, for sure. I still have the, I have both of these, I have copies of both of these in stories right, right now because sure. I kept them. And I was just sending Ultra um, uh, a picture of, I think, at least one of them. I haven't been to it yet, but somebody sent me a picture of the, Hip Hop Till Infinity show that's going on, um, that's happening. I'm not sure when this is going to run, but the Hip Hop Till Infinity show. And in the Hip Hop Till Infinity show, they have the other one, the one where we're looking up. Um, they have it like in encased right now. It's like a, you know, like a, a special, special part to that's some right. something to show people. So yeah, it was really important. Um, SP Magazine is very important and it helped to really bring that, that, that hip hop culture I mean, LA has its own hip hop culture. LA has its own scene, but to be able to connect that with like, like a real essence of that writer culture and the you know the boom bap style sound and these types of things, I think it was super important and definitely important for Dilated. Cool. Well, I'm I'm glad that it's in a way we're coming full circle now. Yeah, we're, for sure. We're back around, and which brings me into um, the next topic, which is now you guys got big. You're on tour. Um. How did, so we'll, we'll just start with this first one, is just how did graffiti incorporate into your life now as a entertainer, you know, professional? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, when I met Ev, he was, he's from AWR. So like, you know, we, we had, you know, and we had a lot of friends in common from the writer scene, from the graph scene in LA. Um, when we first started, we were making like a lot of graffiti records. Like we thought that was going to be our thing. We're going to come out and we're going to make, graffiti records like you know um artifacts we hadn't heard of artifacts yet but lords of brooklyn was out and lords of brooklyn was really down with house of pain who we were cool we were part of soul assassins family like that whole circle of things cypress house of pain funk dubious all them so it was like really close there was an you know that was like their thing and we were like you know if that's their thing like we're not gonna really you know that's not, that's not going to be our thing if that's their thing. Like, you know, we had that kind of mentality. Um, but we still wanted to incorporate, like, some of the same principles. So we still looked at, like, backgrounds, how we put together songs, like a sketch, you know, um, highlights to outlines and, like, these other things. We kind of made it metaphoric. Like, we're going to still apply some of these same principles to how we make make our records, make our songs. The way you and make crafted a piece. To make, exactly. And, that, and I think that's why, you know, we create these songs that can stand like as a song and still work together as an album. But we wanted to do that because, and still be ourselves. You know how different writers, like you, you get into the crew because you bring something special mm -hmm. to the crew, you know, like, mm -hmm. Oh, I love this dude's style. We don't have anything like this. Like he, he would work well in here. Yeah. And so, but then when, when everybody does a full, when there's a full production, like there might be like 10 pieces on the wall, but somebody's bringing it all together with the background and it's all some kind of way tied in, but the individual pieces. So we like, oh, these individual pieces, like our verses and the background is going to be the song, the beat mm -hmm. and how we, and we just, you know, we kind of took it in that direction. So, um, so between that and the fact that we both still have had and continue to have like a bunch of homies, you know, family mm -hmm. that are, that are heavy in the, in the writer world, like it's something that made, graffiti a big part of dilated's dna like that's a part of the the essence of how we met how we craft our music and the circles that we always kept now does that mean that when you'd be on tour like writers would come up in your after your concerts and have you sign their peace books and stuff or stuff yeah like that? for sure or invite us like yo we just you know like a lot of times because we're coming to town they'd have different people like you know do like a a, a full production in the parking lot or something like that like they're doing like full two-story tall joints They'd be like, yo, hit the wall or, you know, hit our book or, or whatever the case is, you know. So you had to have your hairstyle still sharp. Yeah, you still got to do it. You still got to do it. So it was it was definitely something that um, that was important to us to make sure that they knew that, you know, this is where we come from, mm -hmm. you know. But we're also 
it, definitely for me, Ev too, like we're from an era where everybody kind of did a little bit of everything, you know, like, you know, you, you know, you might not be the best at one of the things, but you still dabbled in it because it was like a, your collective, everybody kind of messed around a little bit. So I could produce a little bit. I could DJ a little bit. I wasn't the best dancer to be perfectly honest, but you know, I was, I could get by, you know, I was all right with grab. My, my thing was music. Like I turned out to be like, that was my thing. So, um, we just kept that kind of mentality. Like, you know, we, you know, we, we represent this entire culture. We represent all the aspects and elements of the scene and, you know, different people are going to shine in different parts of it in a brighter way. But I love to see, you know, I was talking to you, talking to you earlier. Like I remember you being on the mic spitting rhymes, like, you know what I mean? Like that was, you know, that that's the, that's just where we come from. Like, it's like, yeah, we love it all. Let's, let's do it all. Like let's dabble a little bit. So yeah, it, it, Graffiti is it continues to be a um, a big part of of our of our scene in our circle, and you know I still talk to a bunch of cats today. Brash brother, Stroves. Let's go on that same avenue. How did you transition into when did you first? Let's just talk about when you first started rapping. Who were your influences? You come from a different side of town. You come from that Good Life Cafe side, Lamert, all Crenshaw that way. Different different type of right. rapping. Um, Hip hop has always been the vehicle. In regards to the music, so my early influences, G Rap, Kane, Run DMC, DOC, MC Brand, as well as NWA, you know, above the law. But I wrote my, I mean, graffiti was the first love. I wrote my, got into rhyme writing in about 91. And it sound, my first rhyme sounded just like Q Tip. You know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's when uh, People's Instinctive Travels, for that first album really, really made an impact I on me. It. Yeah, because that was that was really I was heavily into the native tongues movement, but um, I got turned on to the Good Life Cafe. Shout out B Hall and and uh, Ben Caldwell, you know, and that was every Thursday. And also shout out Freestyle Fellowship, AC Alone, Micah Nine, um, Jupiter and Peace, yeah. DJ Kilu, you know what I'm saying? Mean Green, rest in peace. You know what I'm saying? Ganja K, rest in peace. But um, we used to always go to the Good Life Cafe, and that was held at a health food store on Exposition in Crenshaw. Now, um, there was a no cursing rule there, and, you know, you had to come with your best bars, and it was an alternative, sort of kind of like a... Um, like kind of how Radio Tron was, how Mel started Radio Tron as an alternative for the kids and that's, that want to get away from the gang banging and negative elements and come get into the hip hop elements. So Good Life Cafe was kind of like that, you know, and um, that was when uh, I was heavy into to rhyme writing in and, and music as well. I'm gonna share a quick uh, story about the Good Life before we get off that. Um, I went there one time, and it was a spoon, teaspoon, spoon of iodine. And he he uh, had just he you know he always has lyrics he was writing and so he got invited to go up there because he's part of the freestyle fellowship he 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 was uh, got invited to do an acapella of his song um, one of his songs right and um, what ends up happening is uh, that that night we get there and uh, and they said and it was like the 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 young lady who ran the place what was her name behold. B. Hall, she got up there and would say, these are the rules to all of the MCs. You know, you could do this, you could do that, but don't, and one of them was, if you say the N-word, everybody's going to say this or something like, like they, they clowned you. Please pass the mic. Or any Please filler. Please pass the mic. Please, yeah. yeah. Or filler words. Like, yeah. like you weren't allowed to be like uh, cussing, like, F, 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 because they were saying like, you're cheating. You're not, that's not the craft. Like you're using that as a pause word, like to fill in because you're, you don't, you don't have nothing. You don't have exactly. material. That rule went for anybody, even Fat Joe, when yeah, Fat Joe right. came up there. And I remember volume 10, that was his first night that he released Pistol Grip Pump on my lap at all times. Pistol Shout Grip Pump, Dino. Pump, Dino. Pump, yeah. Pump. Yeah. And that was when he did that song. He featured it. And I remember I said, this is going to be a hit. Yeah. When when this dude, because he said, that's already coming out and stuff like that. And when it came out, sure enough, it ended up being a hit. So that was a cool little memory I had. Sure yeah, enough, yeah, Lynch sure. Mob ended up sounding just like him. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole nother story, though, but, you know, no disrespect. He but addressed it. That was one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good life, man. And um, after good life came Project Blow. So good life was kind of no cursing rules and the rules. It was kind of like a school type. Project Blow was Shark Tank. 
then you can curse, you can, you know, do all that stuff. So it was more aggressive. Battle. That was battle yeah. style. It's like the parking lot of good life was like Project Blow. <laughs> like yeah. after the after the good life, that parking lot would be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, class is over now. We in recess. We on the yard now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen many battles go down in good life park, park good life parking lots for like hours. Yeah. To like two in the morning sometimes, you know. People getting their butts spanked and stuff man. in there. Yeah, man. Memorable battles. Mm. Memorable battles. Mm -hmm. Word. Okay, so that so that so you had a good strong foundation where like you were taught that like, you know, you had to you had to have skills up. Yeah, you I'm know? grateful for that, man. I'm grateful for that. Okay, so now we uh we go forward now to uh well let's start with graffiti in raps. All right. Rocco, you came out with a devastating um it was it 2013 maybe Mean Street 2010 uh, 10, 10 yeah right Mean Streak and uh, talk about that song because it's basically like a roll call that is in a nutshell like the history of LA graffiti in like a kind yeah. of a roll just like with with the names of the all the people you know yeah. describing like who was who yeah it was really inspired by um, aside from my own life and experiences it was really inspired by me hearing. Um, End to end, I think it was end to end burners from Company Flow or something like that. When mm. when when uh, Just did did like his like his scene, and I was like, I want to do something like that for L A. Mm -hmm. Like what I grew up in, and um, it turned out that Ev was talking to uh, LP. He's from Run the Jewels now. At the time, he was LP from Company Flow. Like like that's uh, we know we knew him from Company Flow days, but. Uh, I'm like, y'all want to do this record? I want to do this this whole thing. He's like, I'm with it. Let's do it. So, um, to me, like that captures most of, like the version that came out captures most of like my experience. There are a lot of. There's actually another version that's like longer that has like another verse on it that I've been trying to find. Like I can't find it. But we did it when, when we were making the record. You know, mixing the album. He's like, yo, this is too long. Let's do the shorter version. I'm like, all right, like, whatever, let's just go. Let's just, let's just make it happen. But in doing that, like a lot of people got, got left off the CMA got left off. NSA got left off. A lot of people, I was even give, even give a shout out to Mr. 151. Cause he used mm -hmm. to bomb with this, with oh, the, yeah. um, with the uh, shoe, shoe polish, polish. Yeah. you know what I mean? Like that era of things. So like, but like it didn't, a lot of that stuff didn't really make the, so I'm trying to find it. If not, I'm gonna have to rewrite it and do like a part two. Cause mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that didn't get the, get the proper shine on that. Paris, some of the Slauson guys didn't get, I, I remember giving Paris a shout out on there. Um, but like I did that just because to me, that was like really important for people to understand like where I come from and my base and also like my deepest roots. Like I started mm -hmm. in graffiti yeah. way before I was, thought about making music so right. to me like my roots in hip-hop yeah. are graffiti roots right. and then i expanded out and made music so you know to me it would be ridiculous not to make use of my platform and also being a hip-hop mc like being a rapper is one thing but being a hip-hop mc part of my job like as i understood the job when i took it was to be like the the literal voice of this culture like the different aspects of the culture and even though in me growing up there were a lot of graffiti artists that i knew that were that to be honest, they weren't even into rap music. Like they were into stuff. reggae. A lot of them were into like Slayer and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a yeah. bunch of dudes that were into like, you know, Bad Brains and Fishbone and mm -hmm. like this kind of type of stuff. So, but you know, still, as hip hoppers, we we consider graffiti an element of the culture, and most graffiti artists consider themselves to be an element of the culture. So, to me, that it became my job to also be a voice of that, that element of the culture. culture. Very well said. I appreciate. It. Yeah, definitely. So, Stro, you always peppered your, since you started coming out with the Monstro concept and really um, putting out singles and stuff, you always incorporated, I noticed, like a little bit of graph stuff in there. You know what I'm saying? It was always been a part of like, it's like you don't use it as a gimmick. It's more like you talk about it as, as just a part of your get down. Yes, yeah, it's and it's in my makeup. It's not made up. It's in me, not on me. You know, um, First Love was graffiti similar to, to Raka and, um, uh, I think that's why we mesh so well in the song also. But um, the first, uh, this is back to the music. I was a part of a group called uh, the Berserkos in around 97, 98. And we were on a, a label called Czar Casket Records. But we had distribution through ground level, which Dilated was also a part of. This guy named Yuri ran, uh, ran ground level. So that's when I first started crossing paths with these gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? That was like... 
like 97, nine, <laughs> back then, 98. So how did, now we're going to go to the new song, Natives, which is out now. It's a hot single, and it's talking about, it's got a lot of graph and stuff in there. Um, and how did you guys, who came up with it, or how did you guys come up with that? Well, um, it's produced by a producer named uh, Broadway. Shout out Broadway. He's, he, he's done a lot of uh, things in his resume. He's worked with Dove C, with the Dog Pound, you know, he's Exhibit. Yeah, look up Broadway. We got a whole album. I got a part of a whole album produced by Broadway. Me and uh, another gentleman named Mr. CR. We got a dope album with, with Broadway. But as far as natives, I wanted to do something because people come into this game not aware of the branches. You understand? They, they, they pick stuff up and become this graffiti piecer without having a full hand style and just taking in the atmosphere and the environment. You know, and I feel you can't be missing chapters. You know, how you a factor when there's gaps in your chapters. <laughs> you know, so... That was my approach to it, and you know, me and Rocka, we have always, every conversation we have, we can go back to the 80s, 90s, and the conversation, the aesthetic is, is very potent, you understand? So, um, I just felt it, it was a good, and, and we encompassed, because uh, it's too much to be put in the song. That was also what I was thinking, like, I wanted to sit on how I'm approach this, and kind of package everything, because it's, it spans far more than just 16 bars. Mm -hmm. You know, he encompassed it well with the graffiti aspect. I was more so on the culture, which encompasses the graffiti. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a solid balance. You know what I'm saying? So what's the message of Natives, would you say? Um, I think it was just a proclamation of of who, what the foundation of the scene is. Like you were saying, whether we're talking about graffiti or the wider culture, like to, to build that bridge and that bridge between the people and the culture, we are the natives of the scene. Like we're mm -hmm. the people that were from here that that made it work. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I already knew Stro, I already knew Monstro, I already knew Stro as a writer, as a, as a, uh, as a MC. Um, but I think it might've been Trickster that might've, I think Trickster might have sent out the word like, yo, my homeboy, uh, Monstro. I was like, I know Stro. I know. He's like, yeah, but I want you guys to do a record together. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, what? He's like, I can, I think that's how it happened. He, I think he was the one that originally was like, yo, I think that would be dope if you guys did something. And, you know, we know Trick, Trickster is like, it's like our fan, like Ev, Ev's known Trickster since he was like, probably before he was, he was like a kid, you know what I mean? So he was always like around in the scene. Um, in the dilated circle of things, but well, this like, should be normal, right? Like, there's like, I mean, that's common sense. That, like, if you got dudes from, uh, you know, that are from the same city and they both rap and write, yeah, like, it should be. So then be, you know, get along yeah. and build something together, man. Me talking about this, uh, what is materialized? I'm talking to Trickster about this amidst us painting side by side. So <laughs> the whole ride of this thing is very organic yeah. and very valid. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's, it's solid, solid. Crash, bro. Okay, yeah. so this is the time that we're gonna get into uh, shout outs. Uh, well, let's talk, let's talk about upcoming events for both of y'all, like projects, what you're into. Let's let the people know what, where they can find some some of your creative endeavors. Yeah, I just did a. Um, I just put out something recently, uh, just a single. Um, Evidence produced both both songs. Um, one is called Conflict and Contradictions. Conflict and Contradictions, and then the B side is the Singularity. Um, that's the first project that I put out under my name in mad years, you know. Um, obviously, we got the the Natives record out. Shout out once again to Broadway. I remember I remember back before, exhibit, I think early when Exhibit first got his record deal, I remember him picking me up and taking me out to see his homie Broadway out in, I think, Pasadena or Altadena or somewhere out in the 626 and just sitting up there while they were working on, I think, what would later become, like, you know, verses for, for that first album. So... Um, but yeah, like that's, that's, that's what it is. I'm in the studio right now, just working on some things. I, you know, I have to bring it back up when it's, when it's, when it's ready. Um, I'm not supposed to be talking about it right now, but yeah, yeah it's, I'm staying busy. And Any live um, performances coming up? Um, I'm not really sure. There's, there's some things that have been talked about. We, we dilated was kind of on a, on a hiatus for a minute just because Babu, was really focused on getting the the Beat Junkie Institute of Sound, his DJ school with, mm -hmm. the, with that he put out with his uh, with the Beat Junkies crew. Um, it's a really successful DJ academy uh, out in Glendale, and 
Ev being a producer and an MC, like he was super busy working on things. And then me, I just started working on in like marketing and brand and advertising and just doing stuff in a whole different world. Um, but then this past year in 2023, we just started doing some, some really fun shows again, went back overseas for the first time in a few years, went to Switzerland to go knock out a festival, um, did DMC, the DMC DJ championships up in San Francisco, like all these like special events more so, so like that's that's kind of what it is. I think right. for the future, for the for the near future, that's probably what it's going to be. Probably this summer, maybe some more festivals and some things that will be probably be announced pretty soon. Fresh, bro. What about yourself? Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, Natives is out everywhere. Monstro, Brock Iris, science produced by uh, Broadway. That's on all platforms. Um, I want to shout out the West Coast Creations Records. Uh, me and another dude named Mr. CR have a full album called Manual Labor 2, which is completely produced by Broadway. It's a follow-up to another album, a concept that I came up with called Manual Labor. So we just completed Manual Labor 2. We have a single out from that album called Charged Up, and it features AC Alone, produced by Broadway. It'll be a video soon for it. Um, I have a, a solo album that I've completed called The Demonstrative King by Monstro. Um, it's produced by a producer named C1 from the West Coast Creations. Um, I have a single that's going to drop soon with DJ Battle Cat. It features uh, Brittany, a human chandelier. Um, she's uh, uh, singing, singing the hook on it. Battle Cat produced it. It'll be out soon. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, man, just constantly keeping it moving, trying to stay balanced between the art world and the music, you know what I'm saying? Sounds fresh. All right, then. In that case, I'm going to have to do this. I'm macho, but not in the way that you see on TV or in society. I'm macho. Macho because I do good to create peace and change in the hood. Help an old lady crossing the street. Give a jump to a brother with a dead battery in defense of the helpless. Some we respect and others we check. Knights that ride upon storms, prophets that stand in command in the war. Witness the release of judgment and power. The truth shines brightest in the darkest hour. At that time, we'll measure a man by the word of God and the life that he had. So until that day, be diligent, seek reality. Everything Christ is is what we need to be. Okay, what you got? Well, I also have an album coming out with Skill One. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Come uh, on, Rocka. Let's right drop some up. bars, bro. Oh, you want me to do a little, uh, a little let me freestyle? See. Come on. Oh, man. You put me on the spot with the free. Uh, uh, how about uh, Skill UTI, Stro UTI? Check the dilated logo. I bet you see I. That's me. Ooh. Rocka Ira Science, indeed. Rock it on the micro clients and a. Uh, shall proceed now listen mm -hmm. shout to sp magazine magazines they be bucking and i'm on the scene my man skill throwing up that sign but i'm doing like this and i'm off of the mind and that's Ooh. real real like the steel i'm rocking rocker ira signs with that real hip hopping <laughs> chill <laughs> no, yeah. nah, nah, right. nah, 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 nah. <laughs> hit us with some of that chop okay some of that chop this is straight off of the top i send them bees mcs back to the chop shop to get docked for their pay. Everything I say will slay and represent LA in the best way. Western and burning is where I used to be. Experience earning and lesson learning, never turning in my towel. I never throw in the towel. I'm always dropping wild styles and I'll grow old like an old child. Now you know now. I freestyle until I'm C now. Cool. Never mocking these style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, my <laughs> Uh, All right, so for everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Catch you on the next one. Oh, wait. Yeah, shout out. Show. Come on. Coast Creations has a show coming up with Slick Rick, Conejo, and Pause One, hosted by Lush One and Droops, also with MC Life. It's January 27th in Riverside. You know what I'm saying? That's me, Mr. CR, Patrick Antoni, and the rest of the rest Co West Coast Creations, man. People don't realize what a treat it is to see Slick Rick telling some of them stories, man. Ooh. That's a legendary ever. thing. That's an experience ever. you definitely need to catch. Yes, Rock indeed. Rocking, like we said, there was nothing other than your new album coming out, no new show, right? No, nothing nothing booked. You know, I'll, I'll keep you posted, though. Cool, all things, right. Yeah, yeah. All right, shout uh, out. Mike. 
Happy birthday, Mike and Nine. Who else? Shout outs. Uh, I want to shout out the entire UTI crew, the Kings with Style crew, the Rockin' the Nation crew, Criminal Minded Artist crew, JOR crew, TVU. You know what I'm saying? I want to shout out the entire Project Blow, Good Life Cafe, the whole West Coast. You know what I'm saying? Um, the West Coast Creations as well. Um, let me see. I want to shout out my kids. I'm not going to drop their names. <laughs> but peace and love to everybody. You know what I'm saying? Keep it fresh. Shout out to Skecker, Hungary, my homeboy from UTI out there. Love you, baby. Trickster. Shout out to Trickster for sure. Shout out to the whole Create to Devastate crew. Dilated People's Family Worldwide Expansion Team. Um, everybody from the hip-hop shop era that's still making moves to this day. Um, of course, the whole classic Burners crew. Um, Trickster, as my man Stro said. And uh, everybody that's been supporting Dilated from Jump. Support me solo. I appreciate it. It's all love. All right. Peace. Mozart. All right. Let's catch some tags. <laughs> Let's do it. Because time is our most precious resource. Always remember that every minute, every second, and every moment matters. So let's do our best to live a kind, compassionate, and loving life. And God willing, we'll see you in the next episode. One.